Good, a- good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Great. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for, for coming back so promptly after, after lunch. It's always the, the most difficult session of the day to chair. That's why they gave it to me. Um, my name is Colin Rafter. I'm a member of the Standing Committee of International Affairs and International Affairs in the Academy here. And I'm retired, uh, retiree from the Department of Foreign Affairs, but of course I'm not in any sense representing them here this afternoon. If you like, I'm the total non-academic chair uh, today. Uh, we have three very, three interesting presentations and four very uh, stimulating and interesting people. Um, we, we'll start in a minute with, with Claire Doherty, who's, who's already up at the lectern. We hope to have Dr. Ramit Abudu. Uh, if she doesn't come, we'll just con- continue without her. And then the final two speakers will be uh, Michelle Cowley Cunningham and Alexis Carey. And I'll say a little bit about each of the speakers uh, before they start to speak. Um, we, we, you have 15 minutes, uh, Claire. I've been told to give you a two minute warning uh, and I, I will obey my instructions. Uh, so in, in your own time, uh, I, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I should, say, sorry, I should say something about you. I beg your pardon. You're a lecturer in social policy in UCC. Uh, you, her main interests include migration policy, border se- securitization and border violence, refugee displacement, critical multiculturalism and super, and super diversity and Migrant Agency and Solidarities. Her paper is entitled Everyday Violence, Necropolitics at the Frontiers of Europe. Go ahead, Claire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, So so, um, my paper today, as Colin said, is um, Everyday Border or Everyday Violence, Necropolitics at the Frontiers of Europe. And it is based on a growing concern of the treatment of um, migrants at EU borders, particularly in recent years. And rather than safeguarding basic human rights and dignity, law enforcement officers and border police routinely inflict violence on vulnerable migrants using intimidation and gross human rights violations as tactics of deterrence. Such practices include excessive force, uh, pushbacks, accelerated detention measures, assaults, beatings, forced returns to unsafe countries, and the degrading and dehumanizing treatment of migrant, migrants. And this is exemplified through the escalation of excessive measures in a militarized approach, which signals an outright failure to uphold any fundamental human rights to international protection, and effectively removing any right to asylum or the right to have a right. Running parallel with this trend, of course, has been the role of third countries as gatekeepers for the EU. And this raises substantial questions about the EU's approach to migration, governance, border management and immigration. So in my presentation today, I'm going to look at two case studies. One is based on my own research in Tunisia and the other one is the case of um, the Morocco-Malia border looking specifically at the Malia massacre, which took place on the 23rd of June last year. But I also want to look at the role of solidarities and building resistance and capacity building and its potential to actually transform political landscapes. And the organizations that I've been in contact with are very active in doing so. So just in relation to giving some context to borders, We often imagine Europe as opening its borders and having more fluid and porous borders across different EU countries. And I guess with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the expansion of the EU, the implementation of the Schengen Agreement, there was this thinking that Europe is opening up its borders and becoming more inclusive. But the reality is that all it has done is actually reframed its borders and relocated its borders, and specifically to the southern borders of Europe. And I draw here on Zapata Barrero's work when he said it has now become a space of multipolar geopolitics and the world's deadliest zone. Where the Mediterranean was historically once the bedrock of movement and trade, it has now become one of the most hostile environments for movement across the Mediterranean. So what we are seeing is increasing expulsions and pushbacks, surveillance mechanisms and control, a move away from legal and moral obligations, the deployment of national armies across borders, systemic violence and increasing detention measures and (coughs) and forced returns. 
This is just a snapshot of recent UNHCR data from April 2023, and it looks at the figures from the last three years. You can put in any category you want, whether it's male, female, age, and it'll give you a breakdown. But what's clear in all of those is the increasing number of drownings and people going missing. And here you can see in this diagram, the red uh, zone here is the central Mediterranean where most of the, the crossings take place and most of the deaths take place. <clears throat> this is also just um, a report from Alarm Phone. And this is a hotline for migrants that they can contact when they become in distress at sea. It's not a search and rescue operation, but they do alert the authorities. There's many academics and activists involved in this. And this is just one example from the 11th of March of this year, where alarm phone was alerted that there was 47 people on a boat in distress, escaping inhumane conditions in Libya. They contacted the authorities at 2.28 CET time. And it wasn't until the following day, 30 hours later, that somebody actually intervened. That was after numerous um, calls from Alarm Phone and another call from Sea Watch the following day. When they did actually respond, the boat had actually capsized and 30 people lost their lives. And had they been, had they acted and informed people, there was a boat that actually came to their, their rescue, which called Froland. It had been in that vicinity for the previous 24 hours. So those lives need not have been lost needlessly. So in relation to my own research, it's a piece of research. I was very interested in this particular organization called Innovation and Planning Agency Switchboard which has a, a team of very young, dynamic people, young Tunisians. Um, and the CEO is Killian Kleimschmidt, who worked for the UNHCR for over 30 years. And he actually managed the Za'atari camp in, in Syria for some time. But he left working with the UNHCR because he felt that the approach was a very standardized approach. And he said, rather than looking at humanitarian assistance in the way we do in terms of standardized practices of providing shelter, food, and medical assistance, we also need to think in broader terms about what people are losing when they're forced to move, and home being one of them. So very central to their work is creating home for displaced migrants. In relation to my research, I went over a two-week period from the north to the south of um, Tunisia. I got a real insight into the work of the organization. They allowed me into their internal meetings to observe. They brought me to their main offices. They brought me to the areas where migrants' bodies are washed up at sea. Um, and I also conducted 13 face-to-face -face interviews, some of those with migrants who had actually tried to make the crossing across the Mediterranean. Some had failed, some had been deported, and some had seen others drown in that process, friends and family. I also got to do project visits, and central to the work for me was this idea of the body system that they had. And these bodies, and this is why I think it's crucial to participatory mechanisms, these bodies were the crucial link. They were migrants themselves who had been, um, I suppose, working with the organization, but they were the crucial link between migrants who may be pushed back, migrants who may have come um, across the border from um, Libya or other um, North African countries and had sought um, some protection in, in Tunisia. And um, I, I suppose the thing for me about the bodies were these were actual people who had lived experiences and they told me about their lived experiences, which were horrific. And But they were the link. They would go out into the communities, to migrant communities, and make those vital links and build up that trust. And for me, they were a vi vital part of the work in terms of building solidarity. <clears throat> Just in relation to some background context in relation to Tunisia, Tunisia has now become the hotspot for transit migration and for young Tunisians making the, the crossing across the Mediterranean. And there's a number of different factors influencing that. And this is why I was very interested in um, 
Zapata Barrera's work because he talks about immersing yourself in this culture and really knowing the complexities, the history, the social, the economic and political situations in order to inform better migration practices and better migration theor theorizing and analysis. Um, what is happening in Tunisia with young people? They're in a very contradictory situation. On one hand, they're very tied by their cultural background and their religious background. On the other hand, they have huge influences from Europe. And what I found when I was there, even the people working in the organization had this awful um, need to get to Europe. They, that was their ultimate goal, was to get to Europe. And we went to schools where people were uh, they were trying to teach young people to have a different mindset about not taking the journey across the borders. And these were 11-year-olds whose only aspiration at that age was to cross the border, knowing that there may be an, a, a chance that they may lose their lives. Just in relation to the enormity of the situation, I just captured this when I was preparing my presentation. And this is just over the space of two days, the number of deaths and people going missing at sea. It's happening on a daily basis. I saw it when I was in Zarzis myself, bodies washed up, remains of bodies, clothing from bodies, and I suppose IPA and other organizations like that are really working to try and change that and to try and raise awareness, not just in Tunisia, but by linking with other organizations across Europe to build collective solidarity. This is just one of the projects that um, called the Haraga Project, which is a slang name for migrant. Um, and this project, like I said, is one of the, the aims is going into schools and trying to change the mindset of, of young people. Also, when I was there, I got to meet some activists. And this is a museum that was made up by this man called Mr. Mosum. And he, he calls it a space of solidarity. And basically, it's a, it's a, a museum that he's built in his own backyard to honor migrants and people who have died at sea. And he sees it as a, an act of solidarity, but also a way of raising awareness and bringing that message to people right across different countries within a European context. Um, also, what I found was that there is two, two other migrant graveyards there. One was set up, it's called the Garden of Africa by an Algerian artist. He opened it, investing all his life savings, again, as a mark of respect to those who've died at sea, but also to raise um, vital awareness on these issues. And the other graveyard is of Chamsuddin Marzog, who is a fisherman who has set up this burial ground for migrants. And all of these people try and make contact, find out who they are and try and make contact with families. But it's becoming increasingly difficult because the authorities are taking bodies and not even um, doing any DNA testing on them to find out where they may have come from. <clears throat> this is causing huge tensions in Tunisia because many of them are young Tunisians as well as migrants who are in transit through, through Tunisia. But what is happening is there are new solidarities forming. NGOs, activists, academics, and journalists are very important as well in this role in terms of raising awareness and bringing about change and con making connections with migrant organizations in Europe. Um, local, um, locals are building links with human rights activists as well across Europe. The second case I want to talk about is the Malia case. And this is on the 24th, I'm not sure if everybody is aware of this, but on the 24th of February last year, 23 people lost their lives and 77 are still missing. And there's been very little media attention given to this. Um, the way that uh, I don't like putting pictures like this up in my presentations, but this is the reality of what happened on that day. People were thrown in heaps and not even given water. Their hands were tied behind their backs. Some of them were dead. Some of them had to climb over their friends' bodies. There's horrific reports from survivors. And I would urge anybody, I mean, there's, um, uh, sorry, just before I go on to, to, to the Lighthouse reports, I just wanted to say that the reaction from the Spanish um, was to say, the Spanish government was to say that they had no involvement in this, despite numbers of different video clips taken on that day 
and interviews with border police that saw what exactly happened. But they have accepted no responsibility and again framing the incident as migrants out of control and posing a threat and criminalising migrants. The report I wanted to talk about in terms of another side of solidarity is the Lighthouse Report. And I would urge anybody to, to watch this. It's about 20, 25 minutes long. But what it did was it, it brought together a number of different reports from witnesses on the day. It also brought together 147 video clips. And then it reconstructed the border as it would have been on the day to try and ascertain what exactly happened. And what they found out was on that particular day, there had been a number of attacks on the migrants in the forest by the Moroccan police for four days prior to this. And on that day, they actually went there and they gave them a choice. You either go back to the city or you can go to the fence. So a huge group of them went together to try and get to the fence. And, it, and normally where police would have intervened, they didn't intervene on this particular day. And it was only when they had reached the fence and they, they were enclosed that the, 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 the police actually surrounded them from the back and started throwing uh, stones at them, beating them and surra surrounding them in enclosed spaces. They managed to break down the fence and get through to the Spanish side. And some of the, the, the footage is very, very unsettling in terms of the atrocities that took place on that day. Another situation, okay, another situation is the Gurugu trial. I'll, pro I'll just skip over this, but just needless to say that it raised a lot of concerns about what, um, what would happen if there wasn't a positive result. This was two migrants that took a case against the European Court of Human Rights, and they actually won the case at first instance but it was appealed by the Spanish government and it went to the Grand Chamber. And at that point, they ruled that the migrants and the way the, the Spanish government framed it at that time was that the migrants were out of control, they were violent, they were, they were, um, they were criminal, um, under, they were uh, being involved in criminal acts. And uh, because it was framed in this way, the result from the Grand Chamber was that there was other channels available, safer channels available. Therefore, it ruled in the case of Spain. So these are just two cases. But while, while there was a negative result um, in, the, in this instance, um, what it did do was it raised awareness. And there has been a documentary made about this as well. It's available on Netflix. And it's well worth a watch, just in terms of how the legal system works against migrants at borders. So I want to end by saying that while it is horrific what is happening to migrants at borders, there is a transformative nature of collective solidarities. And I saw it in Tunisia, and I see it again in terms of migrant organizations connecting with one another, connecting with activists, connecting with legal people, and connecting with journalists. And migrant solidarities, according to Maurice Sterl, who has also done a vast amount of research in, in the Tunisia case, and he says that migrant solidarities are playing a very important role in shifting discourses of power. And there's another quote there from um, Wurtz, and he argues, and he's talking about the caravans in, in Latin America. He talks about the transformative power of the caravan lies in its capacity to disrupt patterns of collective trauma by bearing witness to the atrocities migrants have suffered and giving meaning to their collective st struggle. So there is opportunities here to re-politicize -politi Europe's borders, particularly its southern borders, in a way that prioritizes human security over state um, security. But there is a need for multi-leveled policies at local, urban, and cross-country cooperation policies. Um, I just wanted to quickly finish, if I may, just on, just on some of the things that were also mentioned this morning about what isn't measured is also invisible in the data, and that solidarities can uncover the way migrant issues are often ignored, and they can be drivers of agency. Justice and solidarity does play a role in, in migrant agency. 
and to ensure the hidden demoralization, dehumanization, we need a critical in, um, insecurity discourse in order to deconstruct the dominant political narrative. And it was something that um, uh, I think Jerry said this morning. He said, the criticism that does not happen, the rules that do not apply, and these all need to be challenged. And this, is, this discourse is deep rooted in a colonial power that has not gone away. And we're seeing the same technologies of power being used again today. So I'm going to end there and hand you back to, to Colin. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much indeed for a very uh, powerful presentation. Our next speaker, I want to go ahead, is Dr. R R Ramat Abudu, and she has a PhD in Public International Law from UCC. At the present, she's a teaching fellow at the Sutherland School of Law in UCD. Her research interests include migration, climate change, sustainable development, human security, and maritime security. Her paper is entitled Human Insecurity, with the brackets, as the only maritime insecurity reviewing the notion of human security at sea. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you so much, Claire, for highlighting um, some of the issues that are very relevant to today's society and some of those issues are also going to be highlighted in today's presentation. Um, so uh, the topic is human insecurity as an only maritime insecurity and uh, the purpose of this is to review the notion of human security at sea. Uh, like Claire has already mentioned, the issue of migration, it's, it's, an, it's a maritime insecurity that is uh, currently threatening um, just general human, uh, general human security. So the overview of today's presentation is to look at what are maritime insecurities and what exactly is the issue? What exactly is the problem? What's the basis of the issue we're seeing on the surface? And then understanding what human security is, which has already been largely dealt with at the earlier stage by um, um, the professor that spoke at the beginning. And then understanding what maritime security is. And then we'll move forward to understanding what human security at sea means. And then I'll just conclude on all these issues. So. Really the problem, what exactly is the issue? Really the problem can be said that we need a sustainable approach at sea when it comes to maritime security. And why we need that sustainable approach is because um, she mentioned the issues on the surface of it, migrants are dying at sea from perspective of migration. But at the core of it is that the law itself actually is the problem. And it's very interesting to investigate that the law itself is a problem because you see that states are using the law as a, as a banner to hide from the responsibility. And that's because there are not legal gaps in the law. They're actually something called legal black hole. So a legal black hole, from your understanding of what black hole is, is that it can be filled. It's something that goes in and never comes out. So the question then is how do we solve that kind of problem? And I term it as a legal uncertainty because then you see that the problem is the content of the law and the interpretation of the law. So the content of the law, I'll give an example from the migration situation she already earlier spoke about. So the migrant situation under the law of the sea, um, the convention for that is called the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, uh, 1982 convention. And under that convention, most of the provisions are already called customary international law. So there are already customs and practices acceptable uh, across the international community. Uh, but the problem is that under the convention, there's something called a duty to rescue at sea. But what you notice is that a duty cannot be enforced without a right. So under the convention, there's no right to be rescued at sea because understandably it's a state, it's a state centric instrument. But looking at it from a human right perspective, under human, human rights law as well, there is no right to be rescued at sea. So really these migrants don't have a right necessarily um, to be rescued, they only have what we call a duty on state. So how do you enforce that duty without a right? Um, and even looking at it from the human right perspective, okay, there's a right to life, there are other rights under human rights law, but human rights is constrained within the concept of jurisdiction. So once there is no extraterritorial jurisdiction proved, then a state doesn't have an obligation. And that's what you find out is that the interpretation of jurisdiction, especially from the European perspective, is very restrictive. So the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Justice, is all interpret jurisdiction uh, extraterritorially very restrictive. So even if there is a cause, 
um, a state cannot be held responsible um, in such situations. So these are legal uncertainties. These are issues within the law that we need to actually address if we're meant to address these issues on, on the surface level. Um, and then going back to uh, the issue of enforcement, the maritime enforcement operations like she had mentioned, are also the source of uh, vulnerability and source of problems for um, migrants at sea. It's either the fact that these operations are delayed or when these operations are conducted, there is a violation of human rights. So it's almost inevitable to have uh, a situation where there is no violation of human rights at sea, especially from a maritime enforcement perspective. Because the nature of maritime enforcement, looking at it from a policy perspective, is state-centric. It's not human-focused. And the reference object is the state, not the people, not the human. And this is where the relevance of human security really comes in, because it helps us investigate not just the law, but the policies to see if those policies are actually um, leeways to promote more insecurities for the human. And migration is a perfect example of that. Um, so like I said earlier on, the state-centric policies, and uh, because of that, we have inevitable human rights violations. So what is human security? I won't really speak on this much, but um, I would like to point out from um, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 2012 what they defined human security as. This is this the, the more recent definition of what human security is. And I kind of highlight there on the screen some of the important um, elements when it comes to human security. Human security is an approach. It's not a legal regime. It's an approach, and it's meant to assist member states in identifying and addressing widespread and cross-cutting challenges to the survival, livelihood, and dignity of people. So it's an approach to assist member states. So from what human security is, you can see that it's really not um, like the human rights legal regime that has uh, an adjudicatory system or any other thing like that, but it's meant to be uh, an approach to assist member states. So the member states are still a very key, uh, play a very key role when it comes to human security. Um, and the thing then is, how do we get the member states to start using human security um, to identify and then later on address some of the issues? And beyond just member states as well, this concept of human security, I have found in my own personal research, is something international lawyers, adjudicatory bodies, and other organizations need to hold on to um, because it actually does help them assist uh, in identifying and addressing some of the issues that challenges the human. And the question then is how? Um, looking at it from the perspective of human security, there are certain principles which have already been highlighted through the course of the conference um, that form the pillars of human security. So the two major principles is protection and empowerment, but more recently we're having that principle of solidarity, which is very important. Um, but all these principles are bent on issues like people-centric, the people-centric principle, um, which questions the fact that how does this affect the people? How does this lead to uh, protection of the people? And then we have context-specific issues as well. So it's context-specific. So each issue, um, so for example, the issues that challenge uh, the Mediterranean Sea when it comes to migration is different from the issues in other seas uh, when it comes to migration. So it's context-specific. Uh, we're asking context-specific questions. are looking for context-specific solutions. And then uh, it's also comprehensive. So you find out that these challenges are cross-cutting challenges, which is already there in definition of human security. The issue of migration is actually a symptom of an actual disease, which is economic insecurities, health insecurities, food insecurities. So it's Dealing with the issue in a cross-cutting uh, cross solution, looking at other issues that are related to that issue. So it's comprehensive in that sense. Um, so with all those principles, we can actually ask the right question. And by asking the right question, we can actually create the proper solution. So when we look at the SDG, for example, which I won't also flog on because it's something we're already, I'm sure, very familiar at this point. Um, but the 17 sustainable development goals are built on this tenant of human security. And you see all the indicators, everything that has to do with SDG cross across seven categories of security, which is economic, food, health, environment, personal, and community, community and political security. So it does recognize that when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to sustainable development, we really cannot focus on one particular issue. Um, human security is such that all the seven categories have to be um, looked at to create the sustainable approach. 
So back to the issue of maritime. So I already mentioned that the maritime security um, policies are largely state-centric. So based on my research, I've divided the maritime security strategies across the world to three generations. So the first generation is a generation which is hard security, which where we have NATO, for example, the US maritime security policies are hard securities where the focus really is on deterrence. So the traditional, uh, the traditional approach to security is the main focus when it comes to first generation. And then we have second generation, which is more or less soft security, um, but still the focus is, is, is on deterrence. Um, it's a threat-focused maritime security strategy. And that's where we have the European Union maritime security strategy coming in. And some of the mar um, European states also adopt that uh, maritime security strategy. And then we have the third generation of maritime security strategy, um, which is, uh, based on my research, have only seen it in the African Union maritime security strategy. And the African maritime security strategy actually mentions um, human security. But why it's, it's still not a sustainable, um, sustainable strategy is because uh, it just mentioned human security on paper, but in practice, it's still not there. So it's something that mentions the term, but doesn't practicalize it. So those are the three generations of maritime security strategies that we have. And all the three are still largely state-centric. So the question then is, um, how does this impact maritime security operations, um, looking at it from the perspective of migration or looking at it from any other perspective? So I'm going to change the, the outlook now because maritime security involves beyond just migration. There's also issue of piracy at sea, right? So you find out that this maritime security strategy, which is quite state-centric and very deterrent-focused, would work, the traditional security measure would work best on offenses like piracy, for example, because of how violent it is in nature. But that same strategy can't work with migration because we're dealing with actual, you know, people who don't have malicious intent, so to say. So the question then is, what kind of approach is holistic enough to deal with issues of piracy while still dealing with issues of migration? And that's where the human security strategy comes in. That's where human security comes in. So based on the um, diagram on the screen, I, I picked it up from um, a work from one of the academics, and it just shows what maritime security covers. And it shows, that, it shows that it covers issues of marine environment, protection of the marine environment. That would look like protection of marine biodiversity and issues, of, uh, issues surrounding pollution at sea, issues of environmental development, issues of national security, but also issues of human security. But the problem with this med the problem with this model is still the fact that maritime security is largely state centric and it still remains at the center of uh, a state's idea of what maritime security is. So we need to shift that perspective and put the human back into uh, as the center of it. And by putting the human back, you already saw in the earlier slides that human security covers other categories of security beyond just um, the environment, it covers health, it covers food. And because of that, it's very easy to do with issues that transcend beyond um, um, the sea issues, but also land-based issues. So most of the threats to the marine environment, most of the threats that, that pertain to marine environments actually um, are land-based threats, are land-based issues. So how can we deal with it in such a sustainable way that we deal with the disease, but also um, address the symptoms? So we deal with the grassroots while addressing um, the bigger issue um, at sea. Um, so we need to build a sustainable maritime security strategy. And how can we do that? Um, by placing human security at the center of maritime security and um, using human security to actually investigate legal regimes um, like the law itself, international law, um, also investigate policies and build policies. And so in that sense, human security becomes an, an analytical tool. Although over the years, human security has been criticized as being um, a non-relevant instrument, but with, 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 with COVID-19, we saw how human security is relevant because we find out that the threat to human is beyond just warfare or the traditional notion of what security is. The actual threat that 
traditional security cannot do it. Um, like the US, for example, has um, put in so many investment in traditional security methods, but when it came to the issue of COVID-19, they were, you know, they struggled to deal with it as a pandemic. So these human security threats um, are things that we really need to notice and, and take real note about. Um, so why is human security at sea relevant? Uh, the first issue, which I've already mentioned, is the interconnectivity of the root causes and the challenges. We need to deal with the root causes and address those challenges uh, and recognize those challenges. But also we need to deal with... Perfect. So we need to deal with the issues of the law itself, the interpretation and application of the law. How does the court interpret the law? How does a human right court, because human right court is a very, um, is very instrumental to this push for human security because like we've said earlier on, it's not a legal regime, it's, it's a concept, it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach. Um, so how do we um, get states, hold them accountable? We hold them accountable through the judicial system, which is um, largely through the human rights courts. So how do the human rights courts interpret this notion of jurisdiction, for example? Um, so what you find out is that uh, like some of the cases you already mentioned before, before the court, especially the, the European from the European perspective, the interpretation of jurisdiction um, by the United Nations Human Rights Committee is largely different from the interpretation of jurisdiction by the European Court of Human Rights, and that's because of the United Nations Human Rights Committee interpret jurisdiction. Um, as a cause and effect notion of jurisdiction, whereas the European Court of Human Rights interpret jurisdiction as um, it's not cause and effect. The fact that we cost it doesn't mean we have jurisdiction, or the fact that it's an effect doesn't mean we have jurisdiction. So it's a very restrictive interpretation of jurisdiction. So we need to address these issues, um, because what you find out is that the, the hotspot is the Mediterranean Sea, so that's within the European context. Um, so addressing these issues and creating a bridge for the protection of people is where human security comes in. It helps us retain and re-question the way we interpret the law, the way we apply the law, the way we read the law and the way we make the law. Um, within that concept of um, protection and empowerment, but also looking at it from a context-specific perspective, a people-centric perspective, uh, a, co a comprehensive perspective and a prevention-oriented perspective as well. And then finally, maritime security operations. So human security as a concept does not negate the necessity of state security, but it talks about how to complement state security. And that is where it's very, very relevant to maritime security operations, because maritime security operations still need to maintain um, that traditional state, state security concept. But however, from um, shifting the reference object, the object of protection from the state to the individual will make a tremendous change um, to, to the dealings with, with humans at sea and just um, humans worldwide as well. So just to conclude, um, the question then is where do we start from? And we start from uh, by placing human security at the center of our uh, maritime security strategies and using human security um, as a concept for international lawyers, for analysts to actually investigate the law itself, to find out the root causes of this for, of the problem, not just addressing it from a symptom level, um, but addressing the actual root cause of a problem. And that would definitely lead us the way forward of creating a system where um, there is more, uh, there's more human security, so to say, and more accountability uh, on state to provide that level of human security. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation and some very interesting ideas about the question of jurisdiction. Um, now we're going to have a historic first. We're going to have two psychologists, and I'd I, I be quite sure in saying that two psychologists have never addressed this particular conference before, but you're, you're very welcome. Uh, there's going to be, if, Michelle, if you want to take, take your place, and I'll just introduce you. Uh, the two speakers are going to be Michelle Caldy Cunningham and then Alexis Carey. Uh, Michelle is a research psychologist with a PhD in, in psychology from Trinity. Uh, she was awarded the Katzenbach Postdoctoral Fellowship at the Law Faculty in the University of Oxford uh, to de develop research examining the psychology of foresight and its relationship to human rights. And she's presently a postdoctoral researcher at the DCU National Centre for Family Business. I just introduced uh, Alexis as well at the same time. She's a child psychologist working at the interface of children's rights and children's mental health. Uh, She's presently at Jigsaw, the National Centre for Youth Mental Health in Dublin, and she's nearing completion of her doctoral studies in health psychology at the University of Staffordshire in, in the UK. So in your own time, Michelle, thank you.
Um, thank you for the kind introduction, Chair, and um, we're delighted to present here as a, as a first for the Psychological Society of Ireland today. Um, just briefly to give you an overview, I suppose my role is to introduce um, the work that Alexis and I will be doing and to develop a paper um, for, in relation specifically to the conference. But the major uh, components of this uh, talk will outline um, basically a, a stakeholder consultation submission that we made on behalf of the Psychological Society of Ireland to the United Nations recently. So just to give you an overview of what we'll discuss um, between the two of us today, um, we'll outline the submission that we made. Um, it's specifically um, connected to the Committee of the Rights of the Child, the draft general comment uh, number 26. We'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and um, just, uh, But first of all, we want to also um, outline the context for it. So to, to really pin down a couple of specific instances of environmental degradation and children's differing experiences in particular. Um, we've spoken a lot today about um, ch individuals in, from the Global South um, and, and those who are in the West. And um, those experiences can differ, but they can also um, be very similar as well. And we're going to discuss that in a little bit more detail too. In particular, we're going to use the concept of climate anxiety, um, which is now held to be a real, not an imagined uh, uh, um, medical, um, I suppose, ailment um, of sorts. Um, there's a lot of science behind that, so we'll explain a little bit more about that as well. Um, and in particular, we'll talk about um, a psychological perspective on the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child and more specifically, Article 24, which relates particularly to health. Um, we will also relate some of the points back to the human, secure, human security and the United Nations uh, development programme, particularly looking at the role of health. And in terms of recommendations that we've made in our UN submission, uh, what we believe is key there is that the mental health and physical health have parity um, so that mental health is not just an enhancement, um, but that it is it is. Uh, it has sort of equal status with physical health. Um, we'll have a look at education and awareness raising to um, empower children um, and their decision making and participation um, in alleviating the climate crisis both now and the future. And we'll make some concluding remarks um, and opening with the question of is it really climate anxiety or is it climate trauma? Um, OK, so first of all, um, just to give you a little bit more um, background, the, the, I suppose, where we're at with the psychologies and how psychology is responding. Um, it's our first ever submission to the UN. The, the reason for that is because we recently formed the Special Interest Group in Human Rights and Psychology within uh, the auspices of the Psychological Society of Ireland. Um, it's, it's a first for us too, not just for our Irish Academy today. Um, it's This uh, climate anxiety topic has gained traction hugely within the the, psychology, the community of psychologists, um, much to our delight, it's gained momentum and we were the cover story um, in April um, on our, on our the submission as well. Um, we also, um, we always wished moving forward to welcome um, any opportunity to comment on the connection between child and adolescent mental health and human rights obligations. Psychologists are, I suppose we're at a, a place in our field where we are increasingly being called to be advocates for human rights. Um, um, not just uh, tend to the the, the ethics um, and guidelines, but to, but to see ourselves as campaigners and um, and interveners um, for for rights, um, and to also uh, to I suppose add to the policies initiatives that will address. Um, infringements. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background in terms of the positioning of our argument. So how does psychology become relevant? It has to find a way to become relevant. Um, so the draft general comment, um, I'll just explain how that comes about, is basically the United Nations oversees human rights treaties bodies and they, they consist of committees of independent experts and they monitor the implementation of all core international human rights treaties. There are 10 um, human rights treaty bodies Bodies and the CRC is the body of independent experts responsible for monitoring the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child by its states' parties. And the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, or we'll refer it now as moving forward as the UN CRC in this talk, is a treaty consisting of three parts and 54 articles. So there's quite a lot to grapple with there. Um, but really, the hook on which we hang our argument is, is Article 24, and that pretty much recognises the right of the child to the 
enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health. Of course, it's not just for children, this is for, for everyone, but just giving children a voice and connecting to children's rights um, is, is, is something that we were able to move forward on more quickly. Um, the recent draft general comment number 26 uh, is a call from the UN for discussion related to children's rights and the environment in particular, so with a special focus on climate change and including child and adolescent health. On examining the remit and the parameters, we weighed on, an, a on some arguments in a very specific way. So uh, in other words, we sort of we had to find where, where we could fit and there was we had a look and it turned out within section three where there was specific rights of the convention as they relate to the environment and B, the, the category B, the right to the highest um, attainable standard of health. So we, you know, we sort of viewed the lens of Article 24 as, as the thrust of our argument. And in particular, point 27, there were many, many, many points to sift through. And we were, I suppose, relieved to find that children's current and anticipated psychosocial, emotional and mental health problems and suffering caused by environmental harm was something that the Un United Nations actually wished to hear about. So we we did a lot of research and we put together this, this uh, consultation. Um, so rather than an, an exhaustive set of recommendations, what we'll do today is we'll just emphasise how Article 24, which relates to health in particular, um, gives us a vehicle for understanding the connection between the climate crisis, mental health, uh, the cascading factors that impact mental health and how that actually gives people, incites them to flee in the first place or how it contributes. Um, so we'll just have a few um, quick examples just to set the scene for our next speaker in regard to the environmental degradation and children's differing experiences. Um, so as we know, environmental degradation, loss of biodiversity and climate change impact children's human rights. They present a serious threat to future generations' enjoyment of health, security and well-being connected human rights. Very distressingly, the UN has reported that 1.7 million children lose their lives annually as a result of avoidable environmental impacts. The, you know, it, it, it's quite a serious, serious impact on children's lives, while millions more are impacted by disease, displaced from their homes and miss out on receiving education. So you can see there that the climate crisis is impacting rights on, on, on many, many levels, not, not just health, but Health is the focus uh, for today. So in terms of the Western world, it's not simply that we're going to argue that um, anxiety or climate trauma or anxiety is, is, I suppose, located mostly in the global south. Um, for example, air pollution causes over 1,200 premature deaths per year in people under the age of 18 in Europe. So those statistics have come in from the, the European Union's Environmental Agency of late. So and climate anxiety is not a luxury. It's not, um, it, it is something that is really felt. It is really felt by our children and adolescents. In, developed, in the developed world. And in the global south, it's not that it's just um, felt there through, through the lens of health, but it's that environmental degradation compounds all the other negative influences. So you can see that um, although mental health can be shaped by social determinants of health, including poverty, food security, nutrition, neighborhood, community, and trauma, the environmental changes are compound, compounding all of these lives in children. And that is, those are what we call cascading factors uh, within the psychologies. And this, as you can imagine, each factor weighs and weighs more and more and more and more than ever. And the psychological impact of that is that people feel they have no choice and they wish to flee. So the psychology of that is what we'll pay attention to a little bit more today. Um, we know there is good work happening. UNICEF, for example, identifies the climate crisis as, as a children's rights crisis. Um, they've developed their own uh, children's climate risk index, and we were having a look at that as well. And some of our arguments run in parallel too. So um, without further ado, I'll just introduce our next speaker, um, Alexis, and she will talk to you about climate anxiety and its psychological influence. Thanks, Michelle. So if we look at climate anxiety, um, much of the recent research in mental health and medical research is focusing on the relationship between climate anxiety and other anxiety disorders that have been outlined in the diagnostic manual, DSM-5, that psychologists use to categorize mental health difficulties. 
And climate anxiety refers to how people perceive fear or dread the, um, the impact of climate change, both for themselves and their family, um, for uh, future generations and for the environment and animals. Um, and how and anxiety disorders themselves, not climate anxiety, are categorized within the DSM-5 as, um, as chronic and severe um, symptoms which manifest um, in a range of ways, impacting excessive worry, panic, sleep disturbance, and um, digestive disturbances in addition. So we know that symptoms diverge between individuals and age groups. And climate anxiety is now in the research being associated with clinical behavioral clusters, such as worrying, difficulty sleeping, panic, and impacts on study well-being and family relationships. And globally, globally children's mental health um, distress is increasing um, significantly in relation to climate change. And it's bleak nar narrative that young people are seeing daily in the news and social media. Um, however, climate anxiety differs from other di uh, anxiety disorders that are within the DSM-5 because it presents a real and rational global threat. So in accordance with the UNCRC Article 12, children and young people have a right to have a say in decisions that impact their lives and, for the, um, and to freely express their views and for those views to be given due weight. And given the opportunity, as we know, many children and young people are readily expressing their climate empathy and climate distress, and may even be more uniquely disposed to climate anxiety. Sorry, it's not moving on. Okay. However, we don't suggest um, pathologizing climate anxiety because paradoxically, from a psychological perspective, climate anxiety behavior is on one hand an adaptive reaction to psychological, physiological, and social threats within the environment. And on the other hand, as I, we've previously highlighted, it, it's also having a negative impact, uh, impact on young people from mild to functional impairment. Um, so what we're suggesting rather than pathologizing climate anxiety is ra rather supporting foregrounding it in climate justice by centering power operations in the, in the child's personal sense-making, was recognizing the need for change to be political, structural, systemic, and at a cultural level. So when we focus, when we look at children on the move and human security and the role of health, is calling it climate anxiety enough, or is it actually, should it actually be referred to as climate trauma? So um, we know that in 2020, 9.8 million of the 30 million people displaced due, due in part to weather related, internally displaced due to weather related um, crises were children. And when we look at that stat, that's 26,000 children daily. So there's been a number, uh, uh, Michelle already mentioned the UNICEF's guiding principles around the rights of refugee and migrant children. And also the PSI um, and our SIG submission to the International Union of Psychological Sciences highlights the need for action and support and a human rights lens around the mental health of young people, um, migrant young people, and the ensuring of health services and participation and decision making. So as everybody in the audience knows, the UNDP and the UNCRC share a common goal of um, improving mental health uh, improving well-being and the rights of children and young people. And I suppose for our, for our submission, we focus specifically on, on two of the components um, of human security. Health security, which has been previously uh, um, defined by other speakers, and community security, which refers to the ability of individuals, children and communities to live in a peaceful and cohesive society with a sense of belonging and an ability to participate in decision making, and the, these helped shape um, the recommendations we made. So the key recommendation, and I know this has been mentioned, uh, Lorraine earlier on spoke about um, mental health. Well, there's a need for parity of physical and mental health. Article 24 of the UNCRC recognizes the right of the child to the highest attainable standard of health and for, for treatment of illness and rehabilitation of health. 
And while it's vital for countries to combat disease, provide adequate nutrition, clean drinking water, and intervene when the risk of environmental pollution presents, it is also recommended that we should endeavor to recommend mental health parity with physical health. And this will lead to the allocation of um, you know, the, the resources that will both will, will support uh, young people who are impacted by air pollution, which is affecting neurodevelopmental skills, and or allocation of resources to support uh, children and young people um, with climate anxiety and or trauma. So another recommendation is to focus um, the allocation of resources in education and introdu introducing climate education change and resources at both primary and secondary school level. Um, we know that, okay, um, and that young people should have a voice in how these, um, how these programs are designed, delivered, and, um, and evaluated, because the research shows that young people who have a say in decisions and are aware of the, the UN, the convention, um, and subjective well-being indicators score better than, the, than young people that don't. Um, another key point is looking at awareness raising. And the UNCRC's Article 17 details children's rights to appropriate information, and that the information also doesn't um, um, impact, it provide, impact young, is, uh, sorry, pardon me, that information material is not injurious to children's young be, uh, well-being. So um, what we're saying here is by in, enabling participatory and I can't, I can't even, oh, sorry, my bullet point has gone there. So just to make it clear, I'm going to read from here. Apologies. Um, it's around, pardon me. Um, that they should, part, sorry, in, enabling participatory and well-informed consumer decisions are likely to support children as non-complicit actors in the climate crisis thereby countering climate anxiety and promoting climate-informed well-being. And I think Claire in the audience earlier spoke about children's awareness of logos. And what we're suggesting is the promotion and, ma and making mandatory of echo labels to help uh, young people make informed decisions. And another key, key recommendation is, which has been highlighted by John and Lorraine earlier is about participation and a climate justice self safe space forum that includes all key stakeholders and children and young people from Western and the global South are important. You know, we cannot create initiatives or make uh, positive changes without their voices being included. So to conclude, um, much of the evidence now, I'm talking about the psychological evidence, is from Western countries. And we know that the unjust paradox of, um, of climate justice is that those who contribute least to climate change suffer um, more insecurity and understand more about the impetus to migrate. And the, that potentially holds true for health and mental health, whether people decide to stay where they live or to seek out a better future. Um, what, in line with other researchers, we're, we're advocating for um, a, a research agenda that reflects a global perspective and includes the voices of all um, in order for us to move forward. And we hope this will lead to policy, maybe uh, trauma-informed border policies um, in order to support this. If you're interested, you can look at our submission here um, to the UN. And I'd just like to thank everyone today and make these acknowledgements. Thanks, Michelle and Alexis, for your very interesting presentation, which I think broke new ground. Uh, we've about 10 minutes, maybe slightly longer. Um, I'm fairly determined to finish in time for coffee because coffee is very important before the, the orange day arrives at four o'clock. So I have some questions myself, but I'd rather throw it open to the floor first and see if there's any questions from the floor for any of the speakers. And if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself, um, please, that would be very handy. Any questions? For John over here. Brilliant, brilliant talks, all three. I, I've got questions for everybody, but I'm just going to ask the, the last two uh, speakers a question. 
Really, really excellent presentation. Um, I was recently asked by uh, the principal of my oldest um, primary school, Skolenda in Salt Hill, to come in and talk to the class about what we learned from COVID-19. And I got some colleagues in geography to, go, to help me out, and we went in, and we talked about it, and I, I wanted to use the opportunity to talk about Foucault for the first time with nine-year-olds, but I didn't quite do that. Um, but it struck us that it was really us learning from them rather than the other way around. And you know, we went to different schools around Salt Hill, and we, I think our message became a little bit better as we went along. What's, what really struck us was the requirement, I think, from little kids of even just nine years of age for the ability to have some agency and the feeling that they could actually change something. And, you know, we just had a very simple message, which was what we really need to do post-COVID is to actually learn to protect nature um, and to insist upon things like, you know, walking to school rather than taking a car and go back and tell your parents this and annoy them with that information and things like that. But it seemed to have worked. And they were so happier, I think, with a sense of agency that they had. And I just wondered, is that something that you came across in in your work is that sort of yearning for agency in, in terms of you know young younger children. Thanks, thank you for your question. Um, well, I suppose both of us could uh, comment on it in different ways. Um, the submission we made, um, we had other recommendations that weren't included, which was particularly the impairment of children. Um, there's a lot of research that shows how children are brand aware from the age of 11. They have the power to influence consumer choices from within the home like never before. So the, the education program that we outlined is basically to give children the information, I suppose the facts, the weapons they need to take all that information into the home and persuade their parents to do things better. Um, there were some compelling studies, for example, where children were particularly good um, at, I suppose, refuting bad supply chains. So there were supply chains where they would feel, they would say, learning, for example, that their toys uh, were made by other children or clothing were made by other children made them feel the words were poisoned and those kind, that kind of dialogue. So encouraging children to express themselves. So expression first, then agency, and then to persuade um, can be can be really powerful. So the Climate Safe Place forum, forum actually is specifically in relation to product marketing. Um, and I'll just I'll let, I'll let, I'll let Alexis no, to make some no, no. comments. Yeah, I hope. Um, well, I can make um, comments in relation to COVID and children's agency as well, separate to this. Um, I was looking at research around um, young people who attend, who are identified at risk of early school leaving at a young age, you know, due to num number, a number of factors, eight to 12 year olds, and what the impact of school closures were on them during COVID-19. And, you know, it, it was um, quite novel research and it, like they identified a number of things, you know, loneliness, the loss of success that they felt in school that they didn't due to multiple stresses within their families at home, they, they weren't always identified. And what in, in line with the empowerment that their, their inputs into that research then informed policy and practices across seven schools in, in the specific area I was researching in. And that had a huge impact um, on those young people involved and all the other young people. So I think for a, in any sphere, young people and children's participation in and having a voice leads to great change. Yeah. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much indeed. Any other questions? The lady here first in the, in the, in the yellow or top. Hello, thank you very much. Gillian uh, Wiley from Peace Studies in Trinity. Um, those were really wonderful papers. Um, it's very interested, Ramat, to hear about the black hole in international law, about uh, the law of the sea. How could that be closed? Is there any political impetus to do it, or would it be through uh, advocacy or political legal testing. Um, I'm just wondering if it can be closed at all. Okay, um, so the short answer to that is no. <laughs> okay, so the problem is that the black hole, just like a black hole, it really can be closed, but it can be managed. So that's where I developed the idea of human security being a solution, where we find out what these black holes are and actively interpret the law in such a way that closes it to an extent. Not necessarily closes it, but like builds a bridge around it. 
Um, so just putting that image in your head of a hole and then a bridge around it, not necessarily closing it because it can be closed. So in that sense, uh, adjudicatory bodies are aware of the fact that this is the problem. So how can we interpret the law in such a way that doesn't leave the human unprotected? Or how can we leave, how can we interpret the law in such a way that creates more sustainable approach in the future? So that's, that's pretty much the way to go. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I just ask my questions, I think, and then we can wrap it up. And I'm going to go from left to right. Claire, um, what does necropolitics mean? You could answer it in a minute. And could you just define the term solidarity? It's been used in a few different senses in, in, in the meeting today. And what single action could EU member states take to encourage people not to try to migrate? I'm not saying they shouldn't migrate, but is there any actions the EU states could take to encourage them not to try to migrate? Can I ask you, um, you're talking about the black hole, and I understand that in the questions of jurisdiction, but surely one of the problems is that the right to asylum has effectively been undermined. And if you have anything to say about that. And my final question to, to the two psychologists, Alexis and, and Michelle, if I understand correctly, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, um, the UN Committee on the Human Rights is due to adopt the general comment at this month uh, at, its, at its regular meeting. Um, and if it is ad adopted and if it takes on board your, your particular uh, submissions, what's the value of, of that? I mean, not everybody in the room necessarily understands what's the value of a general comment. So maybe we'll start with Claire. Okay, so just in relation to the term necropolitics, I'm using it in this context in terms of who has control or who decides who gets to live and who gets to die. And particularly in the Mediterranean context, there is also a racial dimension to that. And I didn't mention that in, in my presentation, but there is a very clear racial dimension. But just in terms of the term necropolitics, that's how I'm using it in terms of who has governance over who can live and who can die. The second question you asked me was, what do I mean by solidarity? Yeah, it's or in how? different contexts. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, I suppose in terms of my own research, the way that solidarity, I see solidarity is this, um, it's not advocating for, it's advocating with. And that's why I was very interested in the organization that I was working with, because they don't even use the word support. Mm. They use the word accompany. Mm. And they put agency and autonomy at the center for the, the migrant in terms of their participation and having control over decisions that are making. So every decision that they make, it's made with them. They accompany them on a journey, but they decide. Obviously, they put it in the initial supports that are required in terms of psychological supports because people are very distressed and have come from very hostile environments. Um, but that is, is one of the things that they do. That, and. And then as well as that, um, and that's why I mentioned about the body system. I mean, the bodies to me were crucial in terms of building relations and even in building relations with the border police to ensure people weren't sent to det detention centres or weren't put into prison, um, that they at least had some um, way of communicating with them. And, and they would go out at like at two o'clock in the morning. They would get a call. They might have been working all day. They'd get a call at two o'clock in the morning. There's a boat on the way. And they were out there. And they were often um, acting in very hostile situations because people are dehydrated. They've been on boats for days. And they're very volatile as well. So it's, it's, it's creating that kind of environment. But then um, in terms of acting, in so once those initial supports are put in place, it is about acting in solidarity with migrants and young Tunisians themselves who are really dynamic young Tunisians in the organisation could really relate to the issues for young Tunisians and why they actually make this journey across the sea. But then in terms of solidarity, I think with other organizations as well. And these are other organizations that act in the same way in terms of putting people at the center. And not just that, but like I was saying, bringing together organizations, lawyers, journalists, and journalists have played a very vital role in particularly in documenting what is happening to migrants at the border. And I don't think they get enough credit for it, but it's kind of bringing all of those parties together and acting in solidarity, but putting the migrant at the centre and giving them the priority in it. And in relation to your answer to the question, then what could be done by European governments? 
an awful lot could be done by European governments. And certainly one of the things that could be done is this move away from securitization, militarized practices, because, because it is, it's damaging on a number of different levels. And what I saw when I was in Tunisia, even since I've come back from Tunisia, what has happened is because Tunisia is now becoming another gatekeeper, it is actually changing the dynamics of how they govern migration within Tunisia. And there's been a, a rise of xenophobic tendencies within that. They're closing borders that were before that open to them. And there is this kind of hatred towards um, migrants that's a, a emerging. So in terms of what could be done better, there's a whole lot, a whole range of things that could be done better. But first of all, we have to break down and deconstruct that way, that dominant discourse about border securitization. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so just to portray the question, it was uh, pertaining to the uh, undermining of the right to asylum. asylum yeah. um, so the right to asylum, looking at it from a C perspective, it's, uh, it's such that uh, it's only upon upon the state having um, established something called a, a de facto jurisdiction, established something called a physical contact, that's when you can see that those individuals have a right to asylum. Um, just, to, just to give you an example, so there was a case whereby um, Italian Coast Guards intercepted a vessel at sea, uh, on the high seas, and they sent them back to, um, to Libya. And they didn't process their, their, their applications or anything. So they were in violation of, of European Convention on Human Rights, particularly um, collective expulsion under European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so in that situation, the court was like, because of that physical, you know, they, there was that physical contact, they sent them back, there was interception. But in a situation where, like she has mentioned in that presentation, where they don't even pick up the distress call, they can't be any jurisdictional link. There has to be that physical contact. So by not picking up distress call, then there's no even way for them to claim the right to asylum, because then they've they've literally neglected um, establishing any form of jurisdictional link. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so in relation to general comments, the UNCRC um, is ratified by I think 184 countries across uh, the world. So uh, it outlines the both the rights of children and the legal obligations of the countries that ratify it. And the UN committee um, comes together and provides you know, feedback to each country. Each country reports on how they're um, aligning, um, you know, how, they are, how they are doing in terms of children's rights. And the general comments section is how the committee um, describe how state parties or countries should, should implement these rights in practice. So they're very detailed, practical suggestions to ensure the rights of children are met under each of the 54 articles. Great. Thank, thank you very much indeed. I want to thank all the, the, the four speakers for, for their contributions after a lot of food for thought. And uh, enjoy your coffee. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.